Knowledge is power. And this is Powerful Stuff. Wellness Education Cannabis Advocates of Nevada present the Weekend 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour with your hosts, Michael McCollum and Jen Solis. For the next 60 minutes, we'll take an in-depth look at the cannabis reform revolution sweeping the nation. The phone lines are open at 731-1230. That's 731-1230. Or toll free. Toll free. one 866 That's 1-866-820-KLAV. Now, let's bring on the hosts. Here is Michael McCollum and Jen Solis. Hi, I'm Jennifer Solis. Michael McCullough's uh, on vacation this week, and we'll have Kurt Dukoc and Bruce Gale and Beach Baker filling in for Michael. See, it takes three people to fill Michael's shoes. Uh, what do we got today, well, guys? We, we got a little bit of news that's up on the national front. Uh, uh, we got a uh, New Jersey a man sues over medical marijuana job suspension. In Newark, New Jersey, a New Jersey transit clerk who was suspended for using medical marijuana to treat his end-stage renal failure has sued the agency. The suit filed by Charlie Davis, 57, may be the first of its kind in New Jersey where medical marijuana has legally be, been available since 2012. Well, you know, I heard that basically his his job does not require a drug test, but because he disclosed that he is a cannabis user, he was specially singled out to take a little whiz quiz. What do you think about that, Bruce? Well, I'm an attorney, but I'm not licensed in uh, New Jersey. So uh, I'd rather punt on this one. If it was an issue of Nevada law, that would be a totally different issue. Well, I was, I was going to say, so it, what if it was Nevada law? He had, he had a federal job. It's a federal job with the railroad um, that does not require a year analysis to, to join. And he, he, had been a, he had been an employee of the railroad for a, a, an extended period of time. And once he told them that he was a medical cannabis user, they sent him to go take a urinalysis specially. And when he failed, then they said, uh, guess what? You're not, you're not working here anymore. And then his job did not inc- uh, include him to drive or to, or to have control of a mass transit vehicle, though. Was he uh, a union or non-union employee? Did he have a collective bargain agreement or not? Do you know? Uh, you know, I'm not really sure about uh, what the union does in New Jersey. I'm, I'm sure it has a foothold there somewhere, but I'm not sure if the railroad has a union or, or anything like that. But, yeah, he, he's suing over the fact that he was singled out for a year analysis and no other employee was required to take one pre or during their employment there. Okay, well, the uh, the Federal Railroad Administration in, in has its own set of federal laws and rules and regulations, so I really don't have a... a li- good answer well i was going to say you know what if if it was las vegas it is nevada nevada is an at-will state and so basically it wouldn't have mattered here um although the, i i think that they could they could sue for singling out if nobody else requires a drug test and he is the only employee that they've singled out for drug test and he doesn't have you know he doesn't drive he, he's not responsible for human beings lives except for his own um so uh, that's what my thoughts are on it anyway well, uh, it's true that if um, he doesn't have a employment agreement, he is an employee at will and can be terminated anytime with or without cause. However, he might have uh, some type of claim, wrongful termination claim, under uh, uh, Nevada's uh, line of wrongful termination cases. Well, that uh, would be New Jersey's line. Well, but you were asking me if it was in a, Oh, if it was Nevada. If, okay. If it was All Nevada right. law. And uh, secondly, uh, NRS 453A... NRS Chapter 453A, Chapter, excuse me, NRS Chapter 453A, as modified by Senate Bill 372, just went into effect last week, a week from today, April 1st, 2014. And yep. there are some, there's some language regarding employer's obligation and regarding its obligation to, or not to make reasonable accommodations. So I don't have that language quite in front of me. So again, I don't have a great answer for you. Well, it's, I, w- I was just, you know, I, I'm, I want to talk about hypocrisy today. I was at work today and something very upsetting happened. Um, they all kind of know what I do. They know where I'm coming from. And um, there was a teacher, another teacher, and she had a bunch of medical cannabis brochures on her desk. And I said, hey, can I read these? And they all know what I do. And they're like, sure, sure. And she was kind of, 
I, so I started reading the news and I said, hey, I want to see how much of this is like, is this truthful? Or what are they putting out to the public? She said, I got these at a health fair this weekend. So I said, okay. I start to read through these pamphlets and it's about 70% propaganda. And when I started pointing out to her that none of these pamphlets had actual studies on them, medical studies on them, and she's a medical professional, she was saying, well, you know, we each have our opinion. I said, well, no, a medical study is what you guys follow, right? You're a medical professional? Yes, yes. Well, you know, I didn't, and I said, well, are you? I'm concerned that you're going to teach your students this and it's all propaganda and lies. I can get you some pamphlets from studies that were done in America that actually have case studies on them. She said, no, no, I don't want those. It it isn't for my class. I said, well, what is all this medical cannabis stuff for? Then she goes, well, it's for my teenagers. And I said, oh, okay. Well, I said, do you want me to get you something that actually is truthful so that you can give your teenagers? She said, no, no, you know, I'm fine with this. I'm fine with this. I said, well, you know, if, you're, if your teenagers use cannabis and they read these things and they know that 70% of this is lies, what's going to stop them from using heroin, thinking you're lying about that? And I, said, and, and I said, wouldn't you like to present, you know, a truthful opinion about cannabis? And she said, she said you know what, I, I don't want to talk about this anymore. And she buried her head in the sand. The hypocrisy in the medical industry is just crazy. It is crazy. We have some uh, myths, five biggest myths about pot. And Let's hear them. You want to hear them? Jennifer. All right. Pot leads to crime. Is this number five or number one? This is number get, one. This is not like the... the David the, Letterman's uh, top ten? All right, Bruce. Uh, this is Bruce Gale. He's our, he's our legal counselor for We Can. Um, number one is pot leads to crime. Do you know of any potheads uh, that, that go out and, like, rob people or kill people or anything like that what about you kurt i haven't seen any so what do you feel like when when you're uh, medicated kurt do you feel like going to kill somebody nope the uh, the biggest crime i commit is leaving the refrigerator door open <laughs> that's the biggest crime well let's see actually what the studies say uh is that is that a misdemeanor gross misdemeanor or felony in your household uh i pay the bill it's a <laughs> felony <laughs> what do you think kurt I think it's just a misdemeanor. Oh, okay. Okay. Let's see. Uh, Let's see. Let's see. Uh, There is a study out of London that depenalized cannabis for 13 months during 2001 and 2002. The study found that they actually reduced other types of crime because the police could focus their energy elsewhere. This is out of London. So, um, let's see. They've also done some studies in California where the, all these dispensaries are, and again, it lowers the crime because not only do the dispensary owners police themselves, but they kind of police the neighborhood. So any, anybody else got any thoughts about this? Well, I'm sure that uh, Sheriff Candidate Ted Moody would agree that, that uh, pot does not lead to crime. As a matter of fact, I know that his opinions are quite opposite of that. You think that? Okay. All right, what about number two, the gateway theory? If you use cannabis, you're going to go on to harder things like, you know, caffeine, well, I've heroin. Got a, I, I, I've got a theory on that one there. Uh, okay. I, I, really, fear, I really don't feel that cannabis is a gateway drug. It, it's us, it tends to be the last drug that most people use in the progression. Most people start out with cigarettes and prescription pills and move on to alcohol and go to cannabis. And usually that's where most people stop. A majority of the United States hasn't used heroin or crystal meth or anything like that. Uh, those are just the addicts that are always going to be addicts that move on to that kind of stuff. So, so you think that people are addicts, no matter no matter what they do, and no matter what the penalize or the, uh, the penalties for the crime are, addicts are addicts. It's a social problem. Absolutely. What do you think, Bruce? I, I don't buy the gateway theory, and I'll I'll leave it at that. You don't buy? Okay, he doesn't buy the gateway theory, and he's going to leave it at that. Um, I actually am, I am with Kurt on this one. Uh, Not only am I with Kurt on this one, there is a RAN Institute study using data collected from 1982 to 1984, or to 1994, that found the drug use patterns in America youth can be explained without uh, resorting to a gateway effect. People who are interested in mind-altering substances are likely to have tried pot, but uh, as it is, it's the most popular and available illicit drug. 
But this and other circumstantial factors related to drug availability and how someone is going to use them after they use cannabis um, were related more to their own personality and their own addiction patterns and not the cannabis or any other drug they've used. I, I would say personally, when I was young, there were cigarettes and alcohol and then cannabis. And that's kind of, you know, it's not it's not like that the cannabis led me to cigarettes or alcohol. It was, I think it was actually quite the opposite. So let's see. Number three. Oh, we all can laugh at this one very heartily. Cannabis has no medical purpose. Well, Kurt, let's hear about your story. Do you think that cannabis has any medical purpose at all? Uh, it serves thousands of purposes. I think the number one medical purpose is the reason that most people use it, quote, quote, recreationally is because it makes you feel good. You know, it, I mean, that's that's health in itself right there. Feeling good and being happy. Well, so if I if I took a Xanax because I was feeling bad, that would make the Xanax have a medical purpose, right? Yes. So if I take cannabis instead of Xanax to feel good, then that's not OK. Or, or what do you think? I think it's absolutely fine. Well, I, I'm preaching the choir with you. What about you, Bruce? <laughs> I uh, I have no comment on that for uh, reasons I'll go into off the air. Oh, okay. So cannabis has no medical purpose. I don't think I don't think that um, after recent findings with Sanjay Gupta and all these different shows on CNN that. Um, Cannabis does have uh, a medicinal purpose. Um, more in our own household, uh, cannabis has served a medicinal purpose for Kurt. And could you tell us your story, Kurt, about how cannabis has helped you? Well, I started using cannabis medically a few years ago uh, due to chronic back pain and spasms. And uh, they wanted to put me on the uh, Oxycontin for it. And I absolutely refused because Oxycontin is a synthetic heroin. So, uh I, I uh, saw a study on NOVA about it and uh, how when you eat it, how your body processes it, and it actually blocks the pain receptors. So I was, uh, I was a recreational user beforehand, and I you know, decided, what the heck, I have this on hand. Might as well give this a try because I'm not going to take these synthetic, these synthetic pills they want me to take. And lo and behold, after, after four to five days of eating on a regular basis, I woke up you know, for the first time in a long time pain-free in, in my back and was like felt like a new man again and that allowed me to get healthy again okay and so oh, when you were using it for your back pain um and you said that the pain went away and it allowed you to get healthy again were there any other interesting side effects that you can note well you know the number one it made me feel really good and number two uh i would start taking my diabetes medication in the morning and then throwing up shortly after taking my medication and uh, discovered that uh, I was no longer diabetic. So you're so y when people tell you that cannabis has no medical purpose, you can absolutely and uh, unequivocally say that's bunk. Y absolutely. I mean, I'm I'm living proof. I 100% feel I'm alive today because of it. And after all the shows that they that that have been and all the all the TV coverage that this has had. Um, what about the seizure disorders? Have you seen Have you seen some of those uh, Have you seen some of those shows where they show the people having extreme seizures and then right at, almost immediately after consuming cannabis, um, they are these people are not only seizure free but able to ha have a good time and laugh and you know and have some fun with their life. Absolutely, you can't turn on the TV without seeing that anymore. And it, I think it's because of the more people are actually opening up and using this and it only makes sense to me this this plant relaxes you makes you happy makes you feel good i mean the way it relaxes you how could it not work for seizures you know just to even help prevent them and interocular pressure also so they've they've shown that it reduces interocular pressure that comes with glaucoma uh that it it regulates your blood sugar when you're eating it and your insulin levels for diabetes um, seizure disorders, uh, and also uh, side effects from chemotherapy. Uh, there, there are also evidence that it can reduce cancer tumors when directly put on cancer. I've also seen um, empirical evidence 
and pictures of people that have put it put it on their their skin for skin cancers and those skin cancers are clearing up with cannabis alone and this is and it's not a long drawn out process i would i would have to say the pictures are within 30 days that these that these miraculous things are happening well let's talk about number four because number four is marijuana is addictive I will have to tell you, I really don't think that cannabis is addictive, uh, but I will tell you, I had an ex-boyfriend about three or four ex-boyfriends ago, that if he didn't have it, he was snappy, he was <laughs> upset, and I was just like, you know what, you need to go medicate. So, um, so I really don't think it's addictive, but I do think it does have a psychological dependence. Um, what do you think, Kurt? Um, it, it, it may have been that that's just the way he is and the marijuana helps him. <laughs> that could be. That could be. That's, that's interesting. So do you hear that? You're just snappy and mean. Yeah, stay on the cannabis. Okay. Well, um, I would say that I don't think that cannabis is addictive because I have, uh, I have become pregnant when, um, when I've smoked and you know, as soon as I'm, you find out I'm pregnant or whatever, I stop smoking. But I also stop uh, drinking coffee and you know, and any other thing else that that might be bad for me. So it's just an all over health thing. Um, anytime I've ever quit for whatever reason, whether I'm fasting or I'm pregnant or or, or some other thing. You know, I don't notice withdrawal symptoms. I don't notice anything else. You know, I just kind of think, hmm, it'd be nice to smoke. And that's about it. Uh, I will tell you, though, I have given up caffeine. And you know what happens when you give up caffeine? You have this blinding headache. Blinding headache because you're addicted to caffeine. And most people don't know that there is a physical addiction with caffeine. You know what? We're coming up on taking a break right now. When we get back, we'll talk about our 420 moment. I think I need to medicate. Do you need help getting your Nevada medical marijuana card? Dr. Reefer is now accepting new patients. There are no medical records required. We have a doctor on staff to give you a thorough physical examination. There is a 99% approval rate for patients. They also have a money back guarantee. If you don't qualify, you don't pay. Free consultation is available. Call 702-428-0000. 702-428-0000. To get your Nevada medical marijuana card today. The Week at 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour is the nation's only broadcast radio show where you can get the latest news from Nevada and beyond. Learn about the local billion dollar industry and cannabis reform revolution, which is sweeping the nation. Join host Michael McAuliffe, Jen Solis, and their guests every Tuesday afternoon from 4 to 5 here on KLAV. Knowledge is power, and this is powerful stuff. The Week at 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour, this Tuesday afternoon at 4. Did you know that over 100,000 people in America are dying on an annual basis due to prescription medications? Yet marijuana has been around for 10,000 years and used as a medical resource and has never been known to kill a human being ever. But yet we're not utilizing this great medication. Here at Karma's Holistic Health Foundation, it is our sole purpose to get you to your medicine as quickly as possible, all while following the state of Nevada's laws. Please call us today and we will get you your medical marijuana card at 702-388-1119, 702-388-1119, or visit us online at getmedicalmarijuananow.com. Thank you. Weekend 702 is a Nevada cannabis community. We are a 501c3 nonprofit that meets in Southern Nevada. We are a social group that started in Las Vegas for patient support. We've been active in the community for over five years. If you'd like to join us on any of our events or parties, please contact us through Facebook at Weekend 702 on Meetup at www.meetup.com forward slash WeCan702. Our website is www.wecan702.org. Be a part of the Nevada Cannabis Reform Revolution. Please join us and donate today.
Welcome back. We're we're in the studio with uh, attorney Bruce Gale and Jennifer Solis. I'm Kurt Gukach, and that's time for our 420 moment. Today we're going to honor Councilman Bob Coffin. Hi, we're honoring Bob Coffin today. He is the representative for Ward 3. He recently spoke at our symposium, and I have to say that I find this man extremely refreshing. He's both funny and he's candid about his cannabis use and about that he he may get a card because of his aches and pains. Uh, I think that he has helped immensely on city council bring this bill forward with both uh, grace and a good humor. So our 420 moment today is for Councilman Bob Coffin. Hey, hey. I think it should also extend to his staff. Oh. And also his planning commissioner, Trinity Schlotman, who was ah. very helpful at the uh, City of Las Vegas Planning Commission meeting back in February. So his staff is, uh, I think we owe a, a sense of gratitude to them also. You know, I, thank you for that, Bruce, because, you know, so often that we see these people in their public figures and we don't recognize the work that goes behind getting them in place, getting them to these different meetings, um, getting them to these different votes and just, you know, and keeping their calendar and helping them. <laughs> and I and I shouldn't just single out Trinity Schlotman. You have Deputy City Manager Orlando Sanchez. You have City Manager Betsy Fretwell. You have uh, Planning Commissioner Flynn Fag. Uh, you have the Business Licensing Director uh, Karen Huddleston and uh, Doug Rankin, who I believe is one of their. Uh, uh, I don't know exactly what his title is, but. Uh, He's in the planning department, and the list goes on and on. So the entire city of Las Vegas staff. Well, except for my turd in the punch bowl. What was that? City attorney. Well. Well, You don't have to say anything. I'm (laughs) saying it. All right. Um, We were on marijuana is addictive. We yeah, were well, talking about marijuana is addictive. Let's. I was see. actually thinking about that during uh, during the break, and yeah, Kurt. There's there's many mornings I wake up and I don't think, well, I need to, I need to, I need medicate. to hit the pipe. I need to medicate. No, there's times where it's two, three in the afternoon, and usually what keys me into when I need to medicate is I start having pain. I'm like, oh, my back's. Oh, and you know what? I haven't even medicated today. I, I can tell you that happens to me at least once a week, if not more times. You know, and it's so if it's really addictive, why do I not know I'm I need it until I actually need it? That's true. That's true. I was going to say I, there are there are days that you know it's I I forget I forget, and then usually what reminds me is the pain. Uh, I have significant problems in my feet and my Achilles tendon. And if anybody's ever had problems like that, you know that even taking a step can remind you that you have these issues. Yeah, I don't. I never wake up in the morning and like like coffee. Like I need my cup of coffee to go. I never do that Ooh, I do. with 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 marijuana or cannabis. Never do I wake up and say I need this to go. Unless I'm unless I wake up and I'm having muscle spasms or you know severe pain right from the get go, which does happen sometimes. Well, you know, the the other the study that they are doing or studies that they're quoting that say that marijuana is addictive are also falsely skewed. And I'd like to talk a little bit about that. Um, And Bruce, you may you may be able to chime in on this one. It's that when you are caught and you do not have a medical cannabis card, if you are caught with it in your possession, you are offered to take classes so that it gets dropped or taken off your record. Now, if you take these classes because you're caught with it, that puts you in the, st- in the statistic for being addicted to it. Do, do you realize that? So some of these numbers are actually coming from the p- number of people that have been caught without cards. And they say, guess what? If you want this off your record, you need to take this, you need to take this addiction class. And most people go, okay, let's see, on my record or take this $80 class and, and, and say, oh, I'm addicted and it's all cleared for my record. So in saying that this is addictive and using sites and numbers of people that have taken classes for it, it's artificially skewed by, uh, by um, you know, the crim- their criminal record or their fear of getting a criminal record. What do you think about that, Bruce? Is that... Well... Well, the uh, a lot of the major changes to NRS Chapter 453A went into effect just a week ago on April 1st. Mm-hmm. And 
So I think prior to April 1st, uh, under Nevada law, if a person is given a citation or arrested, usually, you know, given a citation for possession of a low-level of marijuana, if they don't have a card, there it's uh, often pled down to uh, it's probationable offense, and it's pled down to a drug not to be introduced in interstate commerce. So you don't, so you don't have a possession of controlled substance first conviction. So if you acquire a second possession of controlled substance conviction, that first one could be enhanced. That's okay. why you have this lesser charge of drug not to be introduced in interstate commerce. But now that since uh, we've got the major changes to the law that went into effect April 1st, um, I'm not, I am personally not aware of any uh, individuals who have been charged with possession of uh, con- controlled substance who had a, or possession of controlled substance because they didn't have their card with them mm-hmm. and, uh, and what the uh, treatment was in the judicial system. So. Well, I was just, um, I, I was quoting stuff that, that actually, that does happen. I've had my friends tell me, you know, this is what, this is what goes on. And I tell them, well, hey, why didn't you get a card? And I was, oh, well, I don't want my, the people in massage therapy to know, you know, because I have a state license. And I'm like, you know what? If, if you keep that attitude, then it's never going to change. And your massage therapy license, i You know, you're signing a paper saying that you're not addicted to anything for your license. You're signing a paper saying that you're not going to do anything illegal. And then you sit there and do something illegal. So you're actually more at risk not getting your card with your license than getting your card with your license. And and that seems to be the sticking point with some people. I've had doctors tell me, oh, I don't want to get my card because of my license. And, you know, I tell them, you know what? These two agencies are not connected. Um, you know, if you're using right now, you're actually more at risk with your license than if you got a card. And that actually just kind of that actually kind of jars some people because you know when they're coming up and they're asking me about it and they're talking about their use they're openly admitting they're using without a card and in front of me and whatever girlfriend might be mad at them at the time and whoever might be standing around them so they're actually in more danger by using the substance without a card than they are getting the card with their their state licenses and stuff yeah, absolutely. Uh, the card gives you a level of protection that you yeah, that you really, I mean, once you get it, you'll you'll feel a weight lift off your shoulders. And now, as of April first, the card's actually gone down a hundred dollars on the state level. So you know it's uh, it's a hundred dollars to the state now, plus your doctor's fees and your fingerprinting the DMV. So the cards are a little more reasonable than they were last month. They're about half price. Um, they're about half price, and if you uh, ha- need trouble, or if you have trouble getting your card, if you are, um, if you have a severe, severe debility, uh, disability, or you have, um, or you have a limited income, you do, we do have a program through We Can that uh, can help you get your card. Yeah, absolutely. Go to WeCan702.org. And go to the contact us link and just let us know your your condition and we'll get right back to you on that. I have three comments regarding what uh, you were just talking about, Jen and Kurt. Sure, Bruce. Um, number one, uh, I recall something. I could be wrong. Something in NRS Chapter Four Fifty Three A that went into effect uh, April first regarding professional licenses. I don't re- recall exactly what the language is, um, but I, I think the second point I want to make is more problematic. Is what's going to what's is happening down in family court. Oh man, yeah. Yeah, uh, where you know, a, a husband and wife have been divorced, and there's been a custody order that's been entered, and one parent has a legitimate medical marijuana card, and the other uh, parent is playing, for lack of a better word, the marijuana card, and wanting a change in custody, uh, supervised visitation. Things like that. I think that's a potential more problematic area that I think our district, our district court uh, family division judges are going to have to deal with uh, because I think that's going to come into another microscope much more after April 1st. And then uh, thirdly, kind of really what we talked about before, I, we didn't give a shout out or thanks to City of Las Vegas Mayor Carolyn Goodman and some of the other Las Vegas City Councilmen who've been favorable to this cause. So... Uh, that we know who they are, and, uh, and we know who they're not. Are we'll leave it at that. So uh, let's talk about if y'all want to regarding the uh, the medical marijuana 
medical marijuana card issue down in family court. Well, let's talk about the medical marijuana uh, card issue down in family court. You know, I've, I personally know uh, a couple of people who have cases in family court. Um, some judges, uh, when it's brought up, they say, this is a non-issue for me. They have a card. This is not an issue um, because I don't think that it, it uh, in you know, that it hinders their ability to be parents. And I know a few judges that have said that personally, so I've heard them. And I do know judges that are just absolutely like, if you don't get off the pot, you're not going to get your kids back. And that was actually a quote from one of um, one of the family court judges to uh, a legitimate medical cannabis patient. We also have a father here that has been denied custody of his child because he's a medical cannabis patient. And I'm, I'm trying to look up the story. I'm trying to look up the story, but he had no issues. The only issue was is that he was a medical cannabis patient. So it's not like he was negligent. It's not like he was abusive. It's not like that he was driving with the child or doing something unsafe with the child. It was just an arbitrary decision by, by a judge. Um, anybody got any comments on that one? Oh, I know lots of people that are doing absolutely nothing wrong and not breaking any laws and are basically being, being discriminated against because of their, their cannabis use or even prior cannabis use. I know people who aren't even using cannabis that are not even part of the scene that are being you know held up by this. So, yeah, there is quite a bit of hypocrisy there. I think the solution is these, some of the family court judges are going to have to be educated and hopefully the, uh, the uh, medical, marijuana, medical marijuana card holder is, is well represented by an attorney who can adequately uh, educate the judge because it might be a case of first of impression for some of the district court uh, family division judges. First impression, as in what they see the client and they they judge it, it, their ability by what they look like. It might no, it'll might be the first time that this judge has had this matter before them. Oh, okay. Since that makes um, sense. You know, there's going to be a significant, uh, uh, presumably significant uh, increase in the number of amount of medical marijuana cards that are issued after April first. Or we we've even seen an increase over the last year. So that's true. Is there like a, a head judge for a family court? Like one like one certain person that that is like oversees everybody else? There is a, a chief judge of the family division. And who's the chief judge? Currently, it was well, it was Art Ritchie, Judge Ritchie, and now, as of January first of two thousand fourteen, uh, I can't remember who it is. Okay, well, I, I actually personally know that I personally know that Judge Ritchie is unbiased in this, and he is fair to everybody concerned. Um, yeah, some of his comments have been just basically like, "This has no bearing in my court," stuff like that. Um, has anybody had a situation they want to call in? If you have a, have had a situation uh, from family court from family court that uh, you want to talk about. Our phone number is 702-731-1230. And we are on the air right now. What are we talking about? KLAV 1230 AM. Our call-in number is also 1-866-820-5528. You can Skype us on KLAV 1230 AM. So if anybody wants to call in and talk about family court judges or judges in general that have that sh seem to show bias in this um we can get on to our fifth point about myths about cannabis this last one is near and dear to my heart cannabis makes users lazy i want to tell you i'm the hardest working pothead in america <laughs> dun, 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 dun. um if this were true I wouldn't be doing 90% of what I'm doing. I'll tell you right now. What about you, Kurt? Does it make you lazy? I wouldn't be on the radio right now. What would you be doing if it made you lazy? Probably sitting at home doing nothing. Or watching Honey Boo Boo. <laughs> 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 All right. Um, this is the most persistent rumor out there. But in, in spite of this rumor, I know doctors, I know judges, I know senators, I know lawyers i know 
hundreds of people who ex presidents ex presidents who are highly functional highly functional people they they're on top of their game and they want to wake up at 8 a.m the next morning without a hangover you know cannabis is the way for them i i i, I know these people personally and again it's usually i don't want to lose my license so i don't have a license and i'm like you know that's chasing your tail but cannabis cannabis users are not lazy people some of the hardest working people I know use cannabis and in spite of them using cannabis, um, in spite of them using cannabis, they're not only highly functional people. These people are leaders in our community. Uh, we have we have somebody on the line. His name is Mark. Um, Mark, what's your question today? What's going on? Uh uh, I, the, some of the uh, the meetings they've had, the recent meetings about the regulations, I just want to get you guys' thoughts on that. And also, uh, the weekend702.org website, I can't seem to pull it up on my uh, on my browser. Is it is something I'm, I'm not putting in? 702 should be spelled out or, or what? No, it's W-E-C-A-N 702, no spaces, no spaces in this, dot org. So weekend702.org. Yep. Yep. Uh, I still can't get it. <laughs> I don't know what it is. I just pulled it up on our browser, so it seems to be working good. Oh, you can also ask access us from our Facebook site. Uh, and, you, have, you, have a phone, you have a phone number? Our, our phone number for us directly to talk to us? No, no, no. To, uh, for, yeah, for weekend702, you have like a... Uh, like a 1-800 number? Yeah. Uh, yeah, something like that. You know, right now we don't have one eight hundred number, and I'll tell you why, Mark. Because I used to hand out my cards all the time, and I got I got calls all the time asking me if I had weed for sale. So I stopped taking my phone number. <laughs> off. I stopped taking my phone number off my cards, um, and I I would write it on the back of any other cards. Um, right uh-huh. right now we don't have like a one eight hundred number or anything else. We're using our own phones uh, for for different services, uh, you know, and different people that you need to contact. You can uh, contact us on uh, Facebook also. We, we If you uh-huh. email us through Facebook, we can answer questions on that too. Yeah, we keep a regular eye on, on our, our websites and everything that's going on. We will be uh, hopefully planning on moving into a building this fall, and then we'll be having regular phone lines and people in the office. So Stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, uh, by the way, I, I, I did get my card. Uh, oh, great. The... Uh, Get medical marijuana now dot org. Yeah, that's great. Right here with them. Well, thank you very much for oh. patronizing our sponsors. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Well, wait. He said he had some questions. You have questions. The recent meetings. No, no, I, I wanted. I wanted to get you guys. What you guys thought about the the, the regulations? Uh, supposedly, hopefully, the revision of some of the some of the ridiculous uh, regulations that they uh, are, are proposing. So what do you thought? What did you think was ridiculous? Well, which well, which which uh, which regulations are you talking so about? Which jurisdiction are you talking about? City, the state's uh, regulations. City. Yeah, city, 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 Las Vegas. Yeah, we we are we are kind of uh, went into that meeting. We went into that meeting, and Kurt. It was the first of the meetings, and Kurt started reading right away, and we started pitching him right there. Uh, some of these some of these regulations are absolutely ridiculous. Like one third of your building can only be used for growing, yeah. while two thirds of yeah. it either lies fallow or or you have offices or something other than uh, cannabis in that uh, cannabis in that area. Do you do you think what what do you think may have been the impetus behind that rule, uh, uh, Bruce? Well. City of Las Vegas business licensing, direct, business licensing director Karen Huddleston said, you know, they looked at a lot of other jurisdictions. Um, and so that might be the basis for for that. Secondly, Mark, I want you to keep one thing in mind and that, that these are merely proposed regulations uh, or a proposed mm-hmm. ordinance. It has not been adopted uh, by the City of Las Vegas uh, City Council. Okay. So... Um, oftentimes in ordinances being, uh, fi- draft, they're, they're drafted, they're reviewed, they're modified. So stay tuned. Yeah. They're having what one, can I get they're having one what more public meeting. Sorry. Yeah. It's on the 22nd, right? 
Yes, on the 22nd, they're having another uh, public meeting on that. And uh, you can also email them. I'll put the link up on our Facebook page uh, tonight uh, where you can go on there and email them uh, about any changes you feel that need, need to be made. What can I get information about becoming a goer? Uh, I went to the site that they, they, they claim that they have, and it's, it's kind of like, I think it's, uh, it's still a uh, building or something like that. I got a full four error message or something. Well, you you want you want to be a grower? Do you uh, own your own building, or you just have the skills and you want to be employed? No, no, no I, don't, I don't. I don't own a building, anything like that. Okay, do you want to be like employed? No, no, I want to work. I want to own the uh, the grower, the grower. Oh, you want to you want to own it? Well, right now. Right now, you can You need to pro, uh, contact a lawyer. We do. Bruce Gale is versed in this law. You can contact him and talk to him about it. Um, you know, you can come to our symposium meetings and and talk to us about it. Uh, you can contact us on our Facebook, and we can we can set aside a time or give you a call and talk to you off the air about it. Um, mm-hmm. It's it, there are a lot of steps to go through, uh, and there are a lot of regulations that you have to follow. Um, some of the stuff that you need to do is, you know, is basically just you know get a building uh, within the city of Las Vegas and make sure that it's not bank owned. Um, right. It's one of the starting steps that you can do. Uh, contacting a, a good lawyer about medical cannabis, like uh, Bruce Gale or one of the other cannabis lawyers that ha- have uh, been working on this. Um, there, you can contact us directly so that we can kind of point you in the right direction also. And so those are the, some of the first steps that you would take, Mark, um, to owning a cannabis, uh, business. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. You You know, we're at a a point now where we need to take a break. And, uh, when we come back, we're going to be discussing some local news. So we'll see you when we come back. The Von Dank Group offers turnkey solutions for all your cannabis needs, bringing transparency and responsibility to a young budding industry. Helping patients by producing the cleanest, safest, and most potent medicines and infusibles possible. The Von Dank Group is a design, management, and consulting corporation with over 30 years of industry experience and knowledge of the dispensary, edibles, infusible kitchen, and large-scale cultivation of cannabis manufacturing facilities. Let the Von Dank Group help you grow your cannabis business from seed to green. www.vondank.com The Week at 702 Nevada Catalyst News Hour is the nation's only broadcast radio show where you can get the latest news from Nevada and beyond. Learn about the local billion-dollar industry and cannabis reform revolution, which is sweeping the nation. Join host Michael McCollum, Jen Solis, and their guests every Tuesday afternoon from 4 to 5 here on KLAV. Knowledge is power, and this is powerful stuff. The Week at 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour this Tuesday afternoon at 4. Welcome back. Welcome back. Bruce Gale is joining us here in studio. He's an attorney, and he is our attorney for Weekend. He's our chief counsel. Uh, Kurt Dukach is joining us, and Beach Baker. I'm Jennifer Solis. Uh, What stories are we we coming back to, Kurt? What's going on? Well, uh, on the the, uh, national scene. We were talking about local news, I thought. Oh, yeah, local news. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> the latest local news would probably be uh, the successful uh, NMCS4, the Nevada Medical Cannabis Symposium 4 that was held this Friday at Main Street Station. Well, that, it was it was really successful, and I will have to tell you that I got a, uh, a very long letter from uh, the CEO of Chiba Chews. He said that he has been to the symposium and these medical cannabis um, you know, uh, seminars in many different states, and he's been over to 16 different seminars. And he said that he had to say that ours was not only uh, the best presented, he got the most information for the money, and that he thought it was a great value. And he sent me this two page letter saying how great we were. And I was like, wow, you know, I've, I've only been to one other symposium and I wasn't in it for another company, and, and I wasn't really impressed with it, but I didn't know what, uh, you know 
California or Washington or anybody else had to offer. But when this guy came, you know, came up to me and said that that, that we were doing a really great job, I was like, oh, okay. And then when I got his letter, I was like, oh, 16 of these things, man. Yeah, I I I, I spoke one on one with him after the uh, after the conference, and he told me that he actually got more information and learned more in that one conference than he did in all of his other conferences combined. And uh, I, he said the caliber of the speakers there were was just incredible. They all spoke on stuff that was relevant to, to the subject, and they were all very helpful and very informative. Wow. wow. That, that's great. Uh, now, I, I want to clarify one thing. Had he gone to 16 seminars that were put on by 16 different organizations, or were some of those 16 uh, seminars put on by the same, uh, same organization? Uh, he, uh, you know what he did he didn't define that in his letter he did say he'd been to several different companies so i don't know if they were 16 different companies um but i do know he said several companies he told letter. me he told me that he'd been doing these for about 10 years now he'd been going to different conferences and seminars and and you know learning different things and that this was by far the best one he had ever attended so, you know, I'd like to thank Michael McCullough for, for getting a lot of our speakers. He, uh, he does our political uh, outreach, and he talks to a lot of these elected officials. And in, in talking to them, he extends an invitation, you know, to the symposium. And, and, I'm, and I'm grateful that he does because some of these speakers, they're, they're like Bob Coffin, who we honored earlier, they just get up and they kill it. You know, they talk about the cannabis, and, and it's such a different view from what I was hearing even three years ago, two years ago, from elected officials that, that I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful for I'm hopeful this, for this industry. Yeah, absolutely. We had, we had members of the state, of the city, of the county, of law enforcement, security companies. I mean, it was, it was, an, it was a phenomenal job. Attorneys. Attorneys, attorneys yep. Lots yes. of, lots of uh, attorneys very versed in this subject on it, right there. Yes, and you know, and and thank goodness they keep me out of trouble. <laughs> Thanks, Bruce. <laughs> All right, um, do we have anything else local that's going on? We, oh, you know what? Our four twenty party is coming up. Oh my gosh, I am so stoked about this one. We have three different bands playing. We have a private venue, and guess what? Since it's after April 1st, I will recognize your certificate from any other state. So if you've given me crap before because you're a patient in California, you should get a band. You're getting a band now because it's law in Nevada. Right. So Yeah, we have lots of good, uh, great music on the schedule for that. We're doing it on 419, actually, the day before 420 because 420, as we all know, is Easter. So the, there's going to be lots of good munchies on 420, but our party we're going to hold the evening before. We're going to we're going to start at 420 on 419 and end on 420. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, and you know the thing is, is that I'd rather party on Saturday with my friends and then spend Sunday with you know with my family on Easter. Uh, Out so, hiking, enjoying the day. Exactly, searching for tiny little eggs that have nothing to do with the rising of you know the Savior. Doing the bunny hop. Doing the bunny hop. Exactly, exactly. So we have our four twenty party coming up, um, and the city meeting coming up, and the county meeting, and the county deadline. Ooh, who's ready for the county deadline? I'm not. You're not. You're still working, huh? You're gonna be working around the clock. Yeah, it just keeps coming up on us. Well, the county deadline uh, that you guys, that we're speaking of right now, we're speaking about the county deadline to get your applications in to be vetted by Clark County before they're sent up to the state. It's actually called a preliminary review form. Oh, uh, and but it is basically what you said, Jennifer. They're they're uh, pre vetting. They're pre vetting. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. It's called it's called a review process where they make sure that all your ducks in order before they send it up to the state. So it's a, like a pre vetting of your application. Um, and if you know if you're not with if you don't have a plan and you don't have a business plan going and all of this stuff going, your best chance at getting in on this is getting in on a team somewhere that 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 somebody may need. The the. The April 22nd, 2014 deadline for the preliminary review form is also a prerequisite to you filing for an application for a special use permit, which uh, the Clark County is going to require. Yes. So, And then there's going to be a hearing. That deadline is May 2nd 
for the uh, uh, special use permit application. And then on June 5th, starting June 5th, there's going to be a hearing on all of the special use permit applications before all seven Clark County commissioners. Oh, so is that that marathon the the meeting marathon that they meeting. were talking about? That's exactly what that is. Now, did these marathon meetings, uh, I haven't really been privy to them, are, are they act, do they actually go into like the night, into like, you know, midnight and stuff like that? Or do they break at like a, the decent hour? I think this is going to be a meeting that's going to be noticed and it can be continued from one day to the next. I don't know how long they're going to go. That's up to the discretion of the Clark County Commissioners. Well, in the last meeting I was uh, attended at the Clark County Commission, they said that they wanted to try to fit it all in one day and not go into a two-day format on it. So they're going to be doing their best. So I'm sure they're going to be stopping the, you know, all the comments about how it helps you and this and that, because that's not really what this meeting I don't e- is about. Well, I don't think there are going to be anybody up there making those comments because the people that are going up uh, to this pre-vetting um, application process are actually going to be these business owners. And if anybody gets up there, one of these business owners gets up there and starts grandstanding, I think that they would shut them down quick, you know, uh, on this. I don't think there's a, I don't think they're going to be able to do it one day. I think there's going to be, uh, well, I don't know. There's going to be a lot of applications for special use permits. Uh, special use permits are not just for medical cannabis. What else are special use permits for? Well, they're generally for you give notice to landowners uh, within, I think, a 500-foot radius of the impacted property so that they can come and have their voice be heard. They can object or say they, w- they want their, they like to the propose use. Okay, special use permits are also, are, are they for special types of businesses besides cannabis businesses? All types, various types of businesses. Various types of businesses. It depends, and it depends. It's all regulated by the Clark County, uh, Clark County Code. So in Clark County, uh, are, are like alcohol permits or gambling permits special use? Yes, they are. Um, what about if you own a car lot? I don't have ty- I don't have the Clark County code in front of me, Jennifer. Oh, so okay. I- I'm I'm just I'm just wondering what other types of businesses require special use permits. I mean, I guess I could see, like maybe uh, a strip club, um, alcohol, uh, gambling. Mm. What else? What else is might be dangerous? What else might be Starbucks? Uh, I'm just joking about that. Um, so these special use permits, how much does it cost? How much does it cost, do you think, to get, like, all the way through a, a special use permit business license? Well, I can tell you the application fee is $5,000 with the county. Wow. So the application fee is $5,000 with the county. Then you have, what, uh, $30,000 with the state, something like that, or it, once you pass the pre-vetting? You're talking about if you get approved by the state. If you get approved by the county, and then it goes on to the state... And then, you, and then if you're approved by the state, it has, still has to, uh, it's a provisional license, and you still have to go back and get approved by the Clark County Business License Department. But the $30,000 you're, you're thinking of is the first-time fee for a dispensary if they're uh-huh. issued a medical marijuana establishment registration certificate. So it's like the hokey pokey. Well, I don't know what you mean by that. <laughs> All right. Um, we'd like to re- um, remind everybody to renew their membership online for our meetup and for our membership. And our address is? Well, actually, you can purchase uh, tickets to your, the 420 Party on our website, WeCan702.org, on 420 Party. You can also sign up for a $100 annual membership there, which will get you entrance to our parties all year long. All right. With all of those facts that are going on, I think that I hear the music for us to end this show. So you guys take care of yourselves and take care of each other and everybody be safe. Okay. You guys have a good day.